You are listening to the Horse Radio Network, part of the Equine Network family. This is Celebs with Horses, highlighting celebrities from film, TV, the arts, and music, and their love of horses. Hosted by award-winning author, Lisa Wysocki. Hello, everyone. I'm Lisa Wysocki, your Celebs with Horses host. As someone who has loved horses as long as I can remember, I've found that many celebrities also love horses, and we're so thrilled to bring them here to you with some interesting conversation and a lot of listener questions. Speaking of questions, if you'd like to ask a question of an upcoming celebrity, just hop on over to horseradionetwork.com to see who might be coming on next and to send in your questions. Now, our exciting news for today's show, and really, I am so, so excited. If you've ever watched classic TV, then you might just be a Trekkie, a super fan of the iconic television series, Star Trek. And while most people know William Shatner as the captain of the Starship Enterprise, you might not know he's also an Emmy award-winning actor, a best-selling author, a recording artist, and the oldest man to fly into space. This is among many, many other accomplishments. But most important, William Shatner, our guest today, is a lifelong horseman who is fascinated by the horse-human connection. We are so happy to introduce you to him right now. William Shatner doesn't know this, but I've seen him compete in several shows, and each time I thought, wow, he's so connected with his horses. A lot of times people think, oh, a superstar who rides. But as you'll hear, this man is a real horseman. And at the very beginning of our conversation, I had two thoughts. One was that, like so many of us, he has a true love of horses. And the second was that here he was opening himself up and being just a little bit vulnerable in sharing his time with his horses. How cool is that? I'm a horse nut, aficionado. I ride all the time. And I just, about three weeks ago, I came off a horse show, which I did very badly in. And you know the the adage that uh, just wait around, a horse will humiliate you? Well, I got humiliated, I thought. My trainer didn't think so, but I didn't. I didn't. I'm always expecting to win. One thing I really like about this show is that listeners get to ask some of the questions, and several asked how a man as busy as William Shatner found time to ride. I was a little surprised by his answer, and maybe you will be too. My lovely assistant, her name is uh, Kathleen Hayes, uh, who uh, as well has horses, knows that uh, any appointment she makes, if it's possible to put it in the afternoon, she does, because my trainer is about a half hour drive from here. So when I'm able to, I'll drive out there and get on a horse and practice reining. On a national level, William Shatner is known for both his champion saddlebreds and his quarter horses. Those are two really different breeds for sure. So I asked how he went from the very showy saddlebred to a working breed like the quarter horse. Well, actually... It was the other way around. I went from quarter horses to saddlebreds and then saddlebreds and quarter horses and then uh, along the way, uh, standard breds. The competition that is held in a saddlebred show, uh, and I don't know why the, so many years ago they incorporated standard breds into, into the show as, as well as saddlebreds, so I have amateur standard bred championships based on our competition in saddlebreds. Okay, wait, standard breds too? How did that happen and why? The standard bred uses the same arena as the saddlebred. So it could be a very small arena and you're going around you're going around the arena with maybe as many as 10 other people driving, you know, I think you can hit speeds of up to 40 miles an hour and going around the far end of the, of the, uh, of, of the arena, you're going around the far end and, and the dirt is skidding out very much like motorcycles. You're, you're, you lose points if you break gate at those far ends. So you got to slow down to what you think your horse can take and your horse can take, um, quite a bit. 
So you're going around those turns, you dasn't break gate, and yet you want to, you don't want the pe- person whose nose, a horse's nose is on your shoulder uh, to get any close. <laughs> <laughs> I have won classes by being right. I'd be the one, but uh, I'd be the one behind uh, the fr- the driver in front of me, and then spin out in in effect. Uh, uh, come to my my left or my right quickly because I had the horse that could do it and just soar past him as I turned the corner. And that was very uh, uh, dramatic and in many, many occasions would win me the class. Currently, our guest lives in California, but he also has a farm in Lexington that he's owned for decades. Unfortunately, mostly due to COVID and travel restrictions, he's not been able to visit his Kentucky farm for some time. But I was so interested to hear how he transitioned to riding his reigning horse, who is in California. uh, Because everything was shut down because of COVID, I haven't been in Lexington to my home in Lexington in three years, two years, two and a half years, three years. And so I haven't ridden uh, saddlebreds in a long time, and I haven't driven the standard breads in a long time. So what I've been doing is here in Los Angeles, going up to uh, uh, Tom Ferran, uh, who's a nationally, internationally known trainer who I have been with for a couple of years now, and going up there and just riding in his arena and practicing everything that reigners need to know, the, especially the rundowns at full speed and sliding to a stop. So I've been doing that a lot, acquired a new horse along the way. We call him Butter. He's a Palomino, but he is super. He's a super horse, and I haven't been worthy of him uh, in meets. I haven't gone to his full potential yet. And I think it's a lack of practice because I've gotten busy and the, my mornings have been occupied. And So far, we've been talking a lot about showing. And if you haven't figured it out by now, in several horsey disciplines, Mr. Shatner's a really big deal. He's been awarded the National Reining Horse Association's Lifetime Achievement Award, and he's in the National Reining Horse Association Hall of Fame. In 2019, he won a world championship with his standard bred road horse, Trackstar, while showing at the Kentucky State Fair World's Championship Horse Show in Louisville. These are just a few of many, many equestrian accomplishments, but there's one other award that he's just as proud of. That award was like, uh, of all the things I won, it's like, that was really the the top of the line, except this year, the California Music Hall of Fame are inducting me into their Music Hall of Fame. And I thought, my God, that's that's an award I don't mind uh, accepting. Music awards aside, I was on the edge of my seat, and I felt I was riding right along with him when he described the excitement he feels when competing in a horse show. There's nothing like coming down on a gated horse, and you're going as fast as that horse can rack without breaking into a canter. And you're right on the edge, and and it's an easy gate to hold because that's why the rack was made, because there's no posting. There's, you sit in that saddle. You, you, you center yourself in the saddle. And there's nothing more exciting than a five-gated horse going full speed, uh, going around a turn and having people coming after you or you're going to take somebody. So that's, that's, that's a thrill, except that when they say show your horses and you're in a saddle and you're in a standard bred bike and you got your legs up and the dirt is flying and there's 10 people around you and you got to get around them and you're going at at 40 miles an hour in a, in a like in Freedom Hall in, Le- in Louisville that's a small arena and you're going around as fast as you can and you don't want to break gate and you go I mean what could be better than that except when you go full speed from one end of the arena to the other and slide 30 feet to a stop what could be more exciting than that With all of the excitement and success during his lifetime with horses, several listeners wanted to know how he got started. And it turns out that, like some of you, he just sort of fell into it. Some many years ago, 40 years ago, I bought some land. It's a whole story involved there. About uh, 200 miles north of Los Angeles in the 
Sierras, uh, rolling but flat land, and put horses on it and have a horse farm there. It's one of the most beautiful spiritual spots I've ever seen. I think it was the Chumash Indians lived there, and there are residues of their existence there. And so I hold that place uh, holy, uh, sacred, for the spirit of the Indians that lived there and the stream that goes by uh, that's from a wild river. And and I bought it because I had, I wanted to, uh, well, I wanted to own the land, but then the whole idea of where I started with horses began, began there, really. Anyway, I bought the land and somebody uh, was willing to live in the, in the house that was on the land before I built a small cabin uh, that the, my family use, uses now. And the guy said, well, what do you want to do with the land? I said, well, I don't know. I wasn't into horses then. I had ridden one horse when I was 12 years old. And he said, well, why don't you run a horse? I said, okay, I'll run a horse. Well, you can't run one horse, I learned. Uh, you know, would you like one potato chip? Even though William Shatner got into horses a little bit by accident, it seems like he quickly connected with his new equine friends. And you know, a lot of people ride and compete without ever having a deep relationship with their horses. But not so William Shatner. In this next segment, he seriously almost brought me to tears with his passionate feelings about horses. The connection with horses and dogs, you know, uh, it's so miraculous. And, 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 and people who, who aren't into it, who don't know, oh, what do you mean? No, no, uh, there's a spirit of a horse. Well, uh, you don't know. No, you don't understand. A horse is a prey animal. And prey animals don't think of yesterday, don't think of tomorrow. They're just wondering who's going to eat me today. So horses, since they're domesticated, still have, don't think of the, what's going to eat me. To, well, maybe they are thinking of what's going to eat me today, but they haven't ever seen a lion or a tiger or a wolf, but there's that instinct of living for today and living for today is the secret to life because you're worried about yesterday. I mean, you know, uh, that's gone and you don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. I mean, it's so simplistic and yet so complicated and horses offer that in their herds and in their and as and as uh, in their lone in their singular, they they offer that feeling of don't worry about that. Just let's go off together up the mountainside and take a look at things. Let me graze a little here and see the peace and quiet. Or let's compete and let's I can do better than that. Uh, yes, so can I. Let's try to. I mean, there's such. And my dogs look at me, and I, my dog, I have two, I, I've had two Dobermans all my, all my adult life, uh, two Dobermans, because uh, th- they need each other for company um, to pack up. And, and so dogs look at you. Dogs look at you in the eye. Animals don't ordinarily look at you in the eye because they think it's um, aggression. But you look your dog in the eye. And he's looking at you, and there's no thought of aggression. It's, it's like, understand me, understand me. And I'm looking at, at him or her saying, understand me. And there's, there's information passing between us that is, uh, I don't know what information it is. It's just an understanding. I'm looking at you. I love you. They understand. If you use the word love and pet them, they understand the word love. And I say to my dogs, I love you, Espresso. And Espresso looks at me and knows, knows what I'm saying. There's no question. And horses, you know, if you, th- 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 there's this wonderful change in, in, in uh, training now where we used to the phrase, let's break that horse. That's a phrase that uh, is used by a lot of trainers to break a horse quickly because it's, it's, it's a, a living, and that's how they make their living. They break the horse quickly, you know, within hours sometimes, and, and now the horse is subdued. And, uh, but there is this other, well, I can't think of the name of the wonderful trainer who, uh, Monty Roberts. Uh, is Monty Roberts is an aficionado, uh, but there are many trainers now who teach by by slowly 
more slow, more, with spending more time in the training process. I don't know what the word would be for the for the establishment that the human being is the is the head horse and you need to follow the rules that are intuitive horse in in the in the herd so that if you may be second in command but you are second i'm first and you got to listen to me and here's how and i'm going to be gentle with you i'm not going to not going to hurt you but i'm going to teach you that i with these reins and this rope and this saddle and these that i am your leader but i'm not going to hurt you because that could either subdue you or make you mad or change your personality or so the and I don't know any other way of uh, of, of uh, expressing it, but saying the Monty Roberts way of training a horse has become the way to do it and breaking a horse, you know, let l- fewer and fewer people are using that term. So there's a horse that you've loved into a partnership and it's a whole different thing. I mean, he's there, he, she, you there is there to a large extent, not completely, by their own volition. You know, they're they're letting you on their back and accepting you on their back as a partner, I think. I'd like to think that was the case. Hopefully, each of us will get to have a heart horse, you know, that horse of a lifetime where the relationship is extra close and special. But some of us, including our guests today, have been fortunate enough to have had relationships like that with more than just one horse. Well, yes. I mean, there's been so many great horses. I was being filmed at this. Uh, I owned a for a while. I owned a farm in Kentucky, and I was running some brood mares. And um, it was an old brood mare whose name I've now forgotten. I was leaning against the fence. I was being filmed, and she came up to me and just sort of put her nose in my face. And uh, I blew breath back at her, and she blew breath at me. We talked, you know. And uh, and uh, I, I turned to camera, and I said, she just talked to me. And the, the person behind the camera said, well, what did she say? And and there was no question in my mind what she said. She said, I'm so glad to be here because the farm was enlightened. You know, we didn't have a lot of mares. We took care of them so well, brought them in, fed them good food. Uh, was attendant to their births. I had knowledgeable people working on the farm. And she was just so grateful. And that, I mean, how do you discriminate that mare from anything else? Uh, I've had great, I've had world champions in every, uh, not in every, not in as a reiner, but every other breed, I've had many world champions. And but the world champions, for me at any rate, are divas. You know, you have to be very careful with them. You don't want to run them too much. You don't want to take them out on the trail uh, necessarily. I mean, they're hothouse flowers. So uh, so they're, you ride them, and then they're put up. And I had a great stallion, uh, which I wrote about, actually. Uh, there's a song called The Black Horse, in an album called Bill. It's out there now, uh, in which I I bought as a two-year-old the most beautiful horse I've ever seen, Sultan's Great Day, who became a foundation, well, almost a foundation sire in the great in the saddlebred industry. Uh, it's a great day, fathered, sired, uh, several incredible world champions. And so he was a great horse. Continuing to talk about his stallion, one he even wrote a song about his enthusiasm for this special horse really comes through. The whole song is about what have I done? Because here was this extraordinarily beautiful two-year-old who became, a, I think she was, if I remember correctly, was a champion two-year-old, became a world champion as a three-year-old. He was a harness horse and showed him under harness all the time, and he won. Uh, he was spectacular, the world champion. And then, well, you know, let's make him a breeding horse. Okay. 
And I had written them several times, uh, not in competition, but around the farm. Uh, put a saddle on him around and this incredible harness horse with this high elevation, tossing you out of the saddle when you post it with a beautiful canter. Huh? And I would ride him. And he was like the horse of a lifetime. Looking for a special gift for a special person? Consider a print or Kindle book from Cool Titles. Cool Titles is a multi-award winning publisher, so you know the quality of the books are first rate and that the stories inside the books will stay with you long after you've read the last chapter. From award-winning fiction such as my own Cat and Wright mystery series or Jonathan Miller's Luna Cruz legal series to nonfiction books about celebrities, art, and leadership, look to Cool Titles for your first choice in entertaining and informative books that matter. For more information on all of the books, go to Amazon.com forward slash advanced dash search forward slash books. That's Amazon.com forward slash advanced dash search forward slash books and type in cool titles under the publisher. And now more from our guest. I so loved Mr. Shatner's connection with his horses and his continuing quest for learning about and understanding of horses. We all have to problem solve through behavior issues with our horses, and his understanding of one specific situation that he went through made me smile. You can read your horse and you read. I I was on a horse. We were selling one of my horses in competition. So the horse was for sale. So I didn't know it. But the horse had been shown to a couple of prospective buyers. And then I arrived and, uh, you know, several hours before he was going to go compete. But but he was a little different. He was a little edgy. I said to the person, he feels a little differently. He says, well, you know, I'm a little upset by the people we were showing him to. I guess they must have gotten on him. Well, he was terrible for the first minute of the competition. I mean, when I say terrible, he would buck. I mean, he would kick out, which is like, forget about it during the competition. Halfway through the competition, he gave it up. And he said, became as docile as he had been in another competition when we were, when I was really working him and he gave it up. But he had been upset by the different people on his back. And I knew he was upset. I didn't understand what the upsetness was until later when the, when the, when the trainer told me, oh, yeah, we, well, we put a couple of different people on his back to, who, who might buy him. After all these years of riding many different horses and many different disciplines, was there one thing as a rider that he still struggled with? His answer wasn't at all what I expected, and when he explained, I felt like I was getting a virtual riding lesson from a truly great horseman. Everything on a horse is balance and hands, right? And and your your legs, of course, but it's all in balance. You've got if you're if you could sit your horse like you have that stick up your rear end and just balance there all the time, you and your horse would be unified. But the horse goes faster or slower uh, at times. Uh, if you're running, if you're if you're moving at a gate, he doesn't just stay at that gate. So you're moving a little bit in your in your balance. When you do that rundown for your for your sliding stop as a rainer, you now have to have your legs. Your your legs in front of you, your feet, your your heels really down, and get braced for that. If you're going thirty miles an hour, forty miles an hour, you, you're saying whoa, and the horse plants his legs, and you got to be braced like you would in a car or a motorcycle for that skid. You're skidding from right. 30, 40 miles an hour to a dead stop, and all you've got are your are your are your legs, are your stirrups, because you're 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 eliminated if you touch the touch the saddle or touch the horse. Uh, and you want to be really, if you want to look really good, you have to be on a loose rein. So you're not going to rein them in if you can avoid it. So you're just got your legs. Now, for me, if you've got your legs forward, the balance is a forward lean. I don't mean a, two, a two point seat, but you're sitting with your legs somewhere in front of you, extreme or or just slightly, and you're braced. You're braced in the saddle with your heels down, your legs slightly in front of you, but your body 
is still balanced in that balance, in that upright, slightly leaning forward position. When you stop, a lot of people teach lean way back, okay? But you, but that destroys the symmetry of a great stop. So what you want to be able to do is stop in the exact same position you're in on your rundown. And that's difficult to do, but it's lyrical, the essence of art. Reigning is such an exacting skill. If you're a quarter turn off, an eighth of a turn off, uh, when you do your turns, you know, if you, on your rollback, if you just take a trotting step, you're dead. I mean, the slightest thing goes off. The slightest look of wrestling with your horse at all. If you don't come down to a slow circle, just absolutely easily. All those things, if you're a real rainer, you really understand raining. It's as exacting as, as a science. Before we ended our conversation, I wanted to circle back around to something he'd touched on earlier, but that we hadn't gotten to explore fully. It was his early years with horses. So how did he come to buy his first horse? I fell in love with horses, and I was a city boy and had no background in horses. My parents wouldn't let me have a dog because <laughs> dirty the, the carpets. So a uh, horse was out of the question. We couldn't afford that. But I got on a horse when I was 12 years old or somewhere around there uh, at a rental uh, stable near us. And I don't know how I did it. Uh, I, I think I swabbed out st- stalls and got enough money to let them me ride a horse. I got on a horse and I was galloping around with the first time on a horse and my mother, they came to pick me up and they, where did you learn to die? I don't know. So what I'm saying is, I think embedded in my DNA is this love of horses, this affinity towards horses that is more than just mine. I think it's come down through my history. I just got on a horse and had a natural affinity for horse. And with that affinity, I, I would imagine comes, not necessarily comes your balance, but you're, all, you're already not afraid because fear interferes with everything. And uh, so if somebody's afraid of getting on the horse, they're already tight and they're already, well, I never had that. I bought this land, and the guy said, well, what do you want to do? And I said, I don't know. He said, well, why don't you run a horse? I said, okay. And there happened to be a... Um, a sale going on, and uh, and you bid uh, uh, on the horse, and uh, so I went to the sale, and this friend of mine who uh, whose son uh, was about thirteen or fourteen years old was there, and he knew the breeding of these horses, and so I sat down beside him, and he had the the pamphlet in his hand, and. Uh, and he said, well, hey, there, there's a horse here. There, there's a horse is there that coming up now. Well, there, there he is. That's a horse you should uh, own, Mr. Shatter. And I said, no, I, I don't know. I don't think it's quick. You know, you said, I said, I raised my hand to say no. And the guy said, oh. <laughs> and I bought the horse. So, so now I, I have to say, wait, and I looked up. You mean me? Now I'm torn. Between, <laughs> you know, Shatner raised his hand and then didn't. And he thought he was going to buy him and he didn't buy it. So I thought. God, I'm embarrassed. I'm so embarrassed. Should I accept this sale? And I thought, I better. I mean, I'm, I'm here to buy a horse. <laughs> What's a pretty horse? I'll buy the So I bought the horse. And that horse was my horse for a long time. I love jumping horses. I love running horses. And I, you know, and I'm enthralled with uh, reiners and, and, and saddlebreds and standard breads. I mean, that's just, I, uh, I just, uh, I love those, I love those breeds, but I love all of them. I love a horse. Well, that was so much fun. Unfortunately, that's it for this episode. You know, it takes so many people to make something like this happen. I'd like to extend my personal thanks to our guest, Mr. William Shatner. Thanks also to Kim, Linda, Hallie, Julie, Kelly, Jen, Pebbles, Kimberly, Terry, Charity, Celeste, Betty, Isabeau, Natalie, Kathleen, and Lisa. You all sent in such great questions. I'm just so sorry we could not get to all of them. And thanks to the Horse Radio Network, now part of the Equine Network, 
Glenn Hebert, Flintstone Media, Mike Mead, Fusion Entertainment, Kathleen Hayes, Neville and Cindy Johnson, and our sponsor, Cool Titles. Tune in next time to meet yet another celebrity who loves horses. (laughs) 